You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we'll be seeing colour for the first time in Fab Fats. There's a big bang in store for the randomizer. And we're going gaming with Byron Atkinson Jones. Ooh, exciting. That's all coming up in Pod 126. Blip, 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 blip. Of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. It's pod 126 of the Jerry Anderson podcast. I'm Richard James, that's Jamie Anderson, and we're here for the next hour and a half or so exploring all the wonders that the Jerry Anderson universe has to show us. We'll be hearing some fab facts in just a moment. We've got some news, 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 news a little later on. We've got the first part of an interview with Byron Atkinson Jones. Chris Dale will be here with his amazing randomizer, and we'll be hearing from our fantastic podsterons. Gosh, I mean, do you even need me here at all? Well, I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> People have been emailing for weeks saying, what does he even do, that Anderson bloke? Yeah, now I'm really hoping for some goat news this week. Well, well, because we had sheep news last week. Yeah. Uh, well, what can I tell you about the goats? Uh, the goats have spent the summer with Nick the ram in their funny yes. little cross-species herd. And now right. uh, Nick has just been paired with his breeding ewes for the winter, um, Hermione Fantastic. and Petunia. So um, now it's a sort of weird sort of fifth wheel kind of fourth and fifth wheel vibe going on uh with mm. mark and harry the goats you know probably feeling a bit left out now that uh, Nick, nick's got his mates for the winter we'll see you next week for <laughs> pod 127 of the jerry addison podcast oh dear you did ask <laughs> uh, no, Sorry. All, all is well on the farm and froggy the ram is recovering well from losing his uh, his uh, horn last week oh, glad to hear it anyway we're not here for that we're here for all the jerry anderson stuff i mean you've already said yeah. all the stuff that's coming up so yeah. without further ado should we dive straight into this week's fab facts oh go on here we go now time for this week's fab facts fab facts i've got a book of fab facts mm. i flick through it richard shouts fab and then i read out the fab yeah. fact to help you stop that's yeah. it that's it. Pretty simple. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why you make such a big deal of explaining no. every week, really. But, no, exactly. Uh, no, I agree. So, are you sure you're you're clear with Dicky with what's happening here? Uh, so, you flick through the book. Yeah. I shout fab, yep. and you read out a fact. Yeah. Okay. I think that's, I got it. That's pretty much it. So. Okay. Don't yeah, wait too long on. to shout fab though this week because we've been ah. doing a lot in the sixties and seventies, and I want to yes. I want to go kind of a bit early if we can. All so. right. All right. We'll see. Are you ready? Yep. Here we go. Fab. Hey. <laughs> okay, How yeah, that? that's pretty good. Pretty good. We are right. uh, in the early sixties, which is you know, yes, good, better than uh, not, I suppose, for variety. Mm-hmm. In fact, we're in the land of XL five. Ah, celebrated its fifty eighth birthday recently. I think is You're that right? Right, that's there good go. knowledge. Look at yeah. you. Yes, fifty uh-huh. eighth anniversary of first transmission was uh, yeah. what on the twenty eighth of uh, October or something Lovely. like that. So happy birthday, Fireball. Now, Richard, I'm sure amongst your collection, which includes two copies of the Doctor Who TV movie. Yeah, that's true, yes. You also have a copy of the colourised episode of Fireball XL5, A Day in the Life uh, of a Space General. Yes. Okay, I'll say yes. No, you obviously don't. And that's absolutely that's fine. Don't worry at all. Yeah, no, that was done, gosh, it must have been 10 or 11 years ago by uh, uh-huh. Legend Films and put out by Network. People still love it now. And, I bet. um uh, yeah, it's it's a really, really nice job. It's an interesting debate, completely aside from what we're going to come up with this fact as to whether you should even colourise episodes like that. But uh, right. we'll yes. leave that for another day. So mm. there's one full colourised episode, and then people often uh, online display their colourising skills by taking screen grabs or short sections from episodes and try to colourise those. Yep. And there was also an attempt in the 1980s to colourise the full series. Really? No, but uh, never went much further than a minute or so of footage from the very first episode, and then they stopped once they realised how costly it was going to be. (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine. I think certainly in the 80s, it was something ridiculous. Like, to colourise a film, it was $10,000 a minute or something like that. Just, you know, it's cheaper Mm. now, but it's still an expensive process. 
Yeah. But it's not always necessary to colorize Fireball XL5 because Steve Zodiac, the handsome and heroic hero and pilot of Fireball XL5, yes. did appear in a handful of color productions. Oh, really? Yeah. So not only did he, Venus, and Professor Matic appear in a couple of Fireball XL5 commercials for Lion's Maid's Zoom Ice Lolly. Ah, uh, yes. Which was shot in colour. Yeah. But he also starred in an episode of Stingray. Did he? But not as Steve Zodiac, no. The, I see. It's the one Steve of those. Zodiac puppet played yeah. vain movie star Johnny Swoonara. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as you probably will know, Johnny was cast as Troy Tempest in a movie about Stingray. A bit weird to have an in a movie in a series about yeah. the series itself in the That's fictional right. world. Mm. In the episode, Stand By for Action. So uh, you do get to see him in colour there. He doesn't need to be colourised. Yeah. But also, elsewhere in Stingray, you may also spot Fire Black Cell 5's Commander Zero in the audience of the Wasp's jazz concert in the episode Tune of Danger. Right? Gosh. And a model of Fireball XL5 itself in Barry's bedroom in the episode A Christmas ah, to Remember, which we'll all be lovely. watching yep. next month as we get Absolutely. into the Christmas spirit. Now, yep. Barry, as with many of the uh, child characters in the Super Mario Nation series, <coughs> was Joe quite annoying, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it turns out that he was quite the fan of black and white Super Mario Nation productions because not only did he have a little model of Fireball XL5, but he was also wearing a pair of supercar pyjamas. Ah, oh, now, well, I mean, you mentioned last week you wanted <laughs> ideas from listeners about what you could perhaps produce next year uh, in You're terms right. of Jerry of merchandise. There's a pair of supercar pyjamas. What How's a fantastic that? idea. I can imagine those <laughs> flying off the shelves and into yeah. the incinerator when nobody buys oh. them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> well, there have been numerous products like that you know captain scarlet stingray and uh thunderbirds yes, pajamas and duvet yeah. covers and oh yeah you know, yeah all that sort of stuff curtains right. wallpaper in fact i'm pretty sure in atomic burgers oh i'm hungry now in um in oxford in the gents lose they've got Thunderb right. thunderbirds wallpaper i think have they yeah how oh, interesting i mean we're crossing into the real world now but and there, there yes. are there are instances of um of kind of in-universe nods to things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, so, Podstrons, have you spotted any Anderson shows being mentioned inside another, be it directly or indirectly? Oh, I like Things that. that prove the TV Century 21 comic link, perhaps. Ah, oh, now I've got a little story about that myself. I, uh, you may remember, JB, I uh, adapted uh, one of your dad's uh, sitcom scripts, The Fat of the Land, into a play. Yes. Which I went to see a production of last year. I remember. And as a little nod to Jerry, they, they had a little uh, model of Thunderbird 2 as part of the set. Oh, that's, that's rather lovely. Nice. So there's, there's one. There's a, you know, a production within a production. It's quite sweet. That's what we like. And in fact, I yeah. can tell you on a recent script uh, that we'd submitted for, uh, to a distributor, we have mm -hmm. a similar little micro nod uh, i can't tell you what it is because it'll give away yeah. the context but uh, yeah. yeah it's nice to have those little things in there isn't it just just of every course. now and again well it's such a rich universe isn't it that you can just literally it's like pick a mix isn't it you can just take something and just plonk it in just for the fans yeah oh it's nice just you just reminded me of that woolworth's hoax from a couple of weeks uh -huh. ago but uh, let's yes. not get into that anyway <laughs> no <laughs> there you go so that's kind of uh zodiac -y, swoonari barry supercar pyjama thing leads mm. us to the end of this week's Steve, Steve Fact. Fact. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's nice. There, so there is a debate to be had there then, isn't there? We'll come back to it one day, I'm is sure, there? about whether we're colourising old episodes, yes mm. or no. See, I would love to see a colourised episode of Supercar, I have to say. Yeah, I think just the one is certainly the way to go. You know, if, if it's not your thing, you don't have to watch it, do you? But to have it there, I think, as a kind of a marker of what it would have looked like in colour, I think would be quite a nice thing. It anyway, would be. Uh, well, that's just me. I think we could probably not have a colour episode of Torchy, but a colour episode of Four for the Falls would yeah, be quite lovely, I think. would be really yeah. quaint, wouldn't it? Yeah, but the thing is, did they use colour when they shot it? In other words, the costumes and the puppets and so on, or were they aware that they were shooting in black and white and so sort of didn't bother? Oh, I know no. in a lot of the early Hollywood movies, the makeup was very specific to it being filmed in black and white. Oh, yeah, it was, it, it was a different type of approach, but they were made in colour. And in fact, there's yeah. some great footage, I think, on the film and Super Mario Nation documentary that Barry Gray shot with a colour cine camera. Yeah. And you can see the actors stood with their puppets... Yeah. All in full colour. So, nice. Yes. Yeah. 
We'll be lovely to see you yeah, great. Now, people have been getting in touch, of course. They've been emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. They've been hashtagging us on Twitter and tagging me, Richard N. James, him, I'm Jamie Anderson, and him over there, just poking through the window. Look, and just see the top of his head, uh, Chris Dalek. And they've also been joining in on our Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podstrons. And we'll be hearing from many of those later. But first of all, here's a few emails. For example, Brian Stephen Christopher Kearns, mm. who sounds like four people rolled into one got in touch to say i think i saw lady penelope's mansion set was used in the casino of the captain scarlet episode special assignment the model was repainted of the mansion for the white house in the launching and in joe 90 where agent 88 was stopping in his room was actually the same set as seen in thunderbirds and the mansion model was used in the episode international concerto of joe 90 the mev seats were also used in joe 90 after captain scarlet finished production i know that props were reused in the secret service such as voice print machine as seen in trial at sea of uh, joe 90 was seen in port what's that trent of episode two does that make any sense of the secret service and that's from ryan <laughs> Amazing spots there, Ryan. Uh, no, I don't have specific <laughs> enough knowledge and memory of, of episode two to know if that's the correct pronunciation. It doesn't yeah, sound it, it, correct, but it'll do. No, it doesn't. But the problem is I put a pen mark through it. I put a circle around that and the, the pen's gone through the last word of that, port something, so I can't read it. That's my fault, not yours, <laughs> Ryan. Thanks for getting in touch. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, because you and I did a uh, watch along, didn't we, Richard James, yeah. of uh, Joe 90 International Concerto yep. for Anton Insiders? Which I quite enjoyed. Yes, but I know. I didn't enjoy the next one, though. Was it Colonel McLean? Yeah. That was rubbish. Mm. And yes, we spotted uh, in that the uh, Lady Penelope's mansion interior being the hotel room for where Igor Schladik yes. uh, is uh, writing a, a, a message into WIN. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Paul Hyde got in touch to say, Hi, Jamie and Richard. I have an idea. Oh. I'm a member of the Podder's Arms. So this is sort of a subset of the uh, Podstron's Facebook group. And he says, and we were talking about something that may be a good idea. If you do the Leicester space thing, we at the Podder's Arms would like to do a quiz. And with a bit of luck, you two may just take part. As we've been trying to get you along for a long time, we all think that would be a good one. Keep up the good work, liking what you do on the pod, but we are missing something. It's time you started using This is the voice of the Podsterons, as I miss that when you have emails. Yours, Paul Hyde. Well, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Everything changes. Everything comes and goes, doesn't it? It does. Uh, it, it would be very boring if it was all the same forever. However, I think... Uh when there is another Fab Worlds of Anderson, I do hope there will be one, uh, perhaps September 21. Yeah. Then it would be great to have a, a sort of Potter's Arms pub quiz yeah. uh, style thing. Wonderful? Yeah, oh, there's yeah. so much stuff we could do. Because, yeah. we, we, you know, for the Fab Worlds of Anderson that was planned for this year, we, mm -hmm. we were going to have um, a sort of celebrity win, lose or draw yes. uh, game oh, yeah, on stage yes. and all sorts of other stuff. And yeah. oh, it was going to be really fun. So, yeah, hopefully yeah, we can carry that over for next time. Yep, and Hannah got in touch to say, Hello, I'm one of those who listened to the podcast from beginning to end. Well, well done, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, she says, I hope everyone's uh, doing okay in these strange times and keeping busy. Maybe it's just me, but I think we're experiencing a similar turn of events like Moonbase Alpha. Normal life has suddenly been blown away and we now have to accept and live in this strange new norm with no idea for how long. Except it's on Earth and there's no nuclear explosion. What do you reckon? She says also, I've been listening to First Action Bureau on YouTube and I'm very impressed. Every time I listen to it, it makes me wish that I can create stories, but I've never been very good at it. The best creativity I can do is basically drawing. Speaking of which, she says, I'm still working on my next Anderson-related drawing, while at the same time, in my sketchbook, I've been trying something with the Thunderbird vehicles, just for a bit of fun, mainly, for myself. For a while, I've been wondering whether to show you the sketches or not, because I'm very shy about it. Hannah says, what I did was something, probably, that no one else has done with the Thunderbirds. I'm worried that if I don't share it, someone else will beat me to it, and then I'll later regret it. But I'm still very nervous about showing the sketches. I don't want to upset any fans. It's nothing horrible, like turbocharged Thunderbirds awful <laughs> at all. I just don't know how to introduce it. Do you want to see it? If you don't, I'll never mention it again. Keep well, and great work as always, Hannah. Yeah! 
Yes, Hannah. send it in, Hannah. We yeah, love your we, we love your drawings. I mean, absolutely. Was it it's the Thunderbird two in the rain? I remember, and that really yes. that really cool angled sketch of Thunderbird one that uh, yeah, Hannah showed us. Absolutely. I think at the Space Center actually. That's right. It was yes, last so, year. Yes, yeah, Hannah, yeah. keep it up. And uh, obviously, if you can create drawings, then you are a creator. You can create. Yes, stuff. and I know. You know I don't get that. Richard James, I mean, you're, you know, better than anyone, you're always creating stories and stuff, but a lot of it comes always. from just doing it and practicing, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, Hannah, you say all I do is basically drawing. Well, there's nothing basic about that at all. No. And we love the creativity of our podstrons. We love their short stories and fan fiction. We love the art that they post on our Facebook group. We love the cosplay. This is what it's all about, Hannah. Do send it in and we'll have a look. Love it. In advance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Any more from you, Richard James, before we... Get on to some Jerry Anderson news? No. Let's get on to some Jerry Anderson news. Well, you've introduced it now. We might as well just do it. Oh, yeah. Yep, it's the Jerry Anderson news. Go on, Richard. What is it? News, 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 news. Oh, that was lovely. Right. Uh, well, off we go. Right, let's start off with First Action Bureau, episode 9. 9 of 10, we are almost there. It's out this Thursday. The CD version, which includes a feature-length uh, edition, a full kind of feature cut, 90 minutes long, plus a CD of extras, is available for pre-order and will be out early December, we hope. Uh-huh. Uh, Farewell Friday continues every single Friday, including this one coming up. We'll be saying goodbye to a range of items in the store to make way for new stuff. Oh, great. Calendars and Christmas jumpers, they are selling out quite quickly, so make sure you grab yours. The Super Mario Nation calendar features 13 brand new short stories, sort of synopses, and some beautiful images by Chris Thompson, and as well as all of your uh, dates for the year, including a load of Anderson dates, like, uh, well, as you can see, Captain Scarlet Day there. That looks interesting. Mm. I wonder what that is. Anyway, uh, 1612, the guys who make fantastic props and all that kind of stuff, well, we're now carrying them in the store and I've noticed this week the Space 1999 Comlock and Stun Gun set which is available for pre-order in January uh, has been rather popular oh, in fact it's sort of flying out the doors as much as pre-orders can do very nice uh, so go and check those out you asked so we answered t-shirts with smaller emblems not all of you all of you want the spectrum uh, logo emblazoned across your chest full size well now uh, four inch logos have been added for international rescue and spectrum so hopefully you'll enjoy those and i wish i was a spaceman the fastest guy alive the single version of the uh, theme tune for fireball xl5 is out Aww. and will be available very shortly it's uh, a nice little seven inch orange version mm-hmm. and precedes the full fireball xl5 soundtrack which will be out very soon too great that's quite a quick rattle through but that is the end of this week's jerry anderson news that was the news. That was the news. And what an exciting collection of news items it was. Oh, is it? I don't remember. Yeah, but when was the first time I sung that? I don't. I don't remember when it was and why it, I did it. And I just seem to be stuck now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You, it's you, funny, isn't you it? You started doing it, and, and yeah. yeah, here we are. A bit like a podcast. Hundred yeah. episodes later or more, and you're still doing it. Uh, it's lovely. It wouldn't be the same without it. No, that's true. Uh, You're listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. A little later on, we've got Chris Dale's Amazing Randomizer, of course, whereby he sits down in front of a random Jerry Anderson episode and gives us his thoughts and comments. And we've also got the first part of uh, Jamie's interview with Byron Atkinson-Jones coming up. But in the meantime, I just want to make this special plea to you, our wonderful listener. If you want to make Jamie and I very happy, then there is one thing you can do. Apart from that, you could subscribe to us on whichever platform you're listening to us on, leave a wonderful review for us to read out in a future podcast, and share us with your friends so they get to hear us too. Also, you might want to join our Facebook group where lots of people have been posting over the past few weeks. Paul Hyder, for example, said, listening to the new BBC Children of Stones podcast led me to re-watch the original 1976 series on YouTube, which led me to spotting Catherine Levy. Now, Catherine was in Jerry Anderson's The Day After Tomorrow. He says, is there no escape from the Anderson universe? Well, no, Paul, there isn't. I suppose, Jamie, I mean, your dad and all those productions employed a hell of a lot of actors, didn't they? So they're always going to crop up somewhere. I think it's pretty unavoidable. In in fact, I had a a text last week from uh, Tim Bellows of Network. Ah, yes. He sent me something where he'd found an old listing of a a particularly memorable theatre trip he'd had. This is from 1st of August 1977, and on at the Birmingham Hippodrome from August 15th to the 20th, a play called Duty Free. Oh, yeah. A new 
comedy by Neville Siggs, is it? Right. Directed by Victor Spinetti. Starring Great. Nick Tate. Really? Ah, <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Yeah, well, and that's fu- great. Funnily enough, just above that, uh, the Alexandra Theatre, the same period, uh, Turn Little Indian, starring Deborah Watling. So Aww. you're either going to get somebody from uh, Anderson stuff or from Doctor Who. Yeah, it, absolutely right. Absolutely yeah. Now, was that pre, uh, pre-Space 1999 just or... No, it was just post. On, on the coattails of. Yes, yeah. I see. Yeah, so, great. Jonathan Westall posted on our Facebook group, said, Hello, Posterons. Sorry for being quiet over the last few weeks. I've recently started new hours at work, meaning each day I start at 3.30 a.m. Oof. Oh. But he says, that doesn't stop me from listening to the podcast every Monday and the latest episode of First Action Bureau. He says, I have the CD on pre-order. I really enjoyed the randomizer uh, on the latest episode with Space 1999, as I was familiar uh, with it, having watched it weeks before. I still have most of year one left to watch at some point, but I'm currently listening to the Big Finish audio adaptation of Breakaway, which is an absolutely brilliant piece of work with a great cast and soundtrack. Yeah, isn't that great? Agreed. Yeah, so we love it where people uh, watch the series and then maybe have a listen to the audio as well and uh, realise it's all sort of part of the same universe, really. You know, it might be a different cast and so on, but it's all much of a muchness, all the same piece of work, which is a which is a great thing. Hugh Morn said, for anyone who uses the BBC Sounds app, I downloaded and, li- and listened to Nicholas Parsons' A Man of Many Parts while at work today. It's 30 minutes long, but it's amazing how much I learned from it within such a short time. It's worth a listen. The introduction briefly references Four Feather Falls yeah. as well. Yeah, that's nice. Nicholas uh, uh, Parsons, who left us this year, I think, didn't he? Was it earlier this year? I think it was, you know. Gosh, it's amazing how time flies by, isn't it? It's hard to keep track. But uh, yes, of course, he was in Sail of the Galaxy, the Terror Hawks episode, which was great fun and great value. And you, in fact, you read in, didn't you, for that? Yes, I did. I was everyone else. (laughs) That's right, because he could only make a certain day. Uh, Yeah, what what a pleasure that was. John McDonald posted, Hi, Podstrons. I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say a big well done to Andy Clems, who writes the stories for us in the A21 newsletter every weekend. Always a highlight. And the recent Dick Spanner Lavender Castle mashup (laughs) was genius. (laughs) Yeah, that was very weird and unexpected. And in fact, he messaged me and said, you know, I think I've gone slightly off the rails and outdone myself with this week's one. And I have to say, I completely agree. Most unexpected. So if you want to know what that is about, then you will have to subscribe to the Jerry Anderson newsletter. Indeed you will. Yes, just head to jerryanderson.co.uk and uh, sign up there. Uh, also, talking of signing up, I recently, Jamie, as part of the uh, the Anderson Insiders, did a, a Q&A. Uh, ah, yes. Where a few people sent me a few questions that I uh, answered and sent back to them. That was fun. And, of course, we had our regular... Uh, well, it's becoming our regular watch along a couple of weeks back, and I think we've got another one planned uh, in, a, in a week or so. I think we're Stingray, aren't we, this one? Yes. Exciting. Right. Anyway, yeah, very exciting. Uh, and finally, on our Facebook group, there were lots of posts about this bit of news uh, from a couple of weeks ago. Water on the moon could sustain a lunar base. Yes. This is from the BBC website. Having dropped tantalising hints days ago about an exciting new discovery about the moon, the US Space Agency has revealed conclusive evidence of water on our only natural satellite. This unambiguous detection of molecular water will boost NASA's hopes of establishing a lunar base. Hooray! Let's Come hope on. they don't dump nuclear waste on the dark side. <laughs> yeah, don't mess it up. Yeah, yeah. it'll be fine. So it'll be fine. Are. But that is yeah. exciting, isn't it? It's nice to see things like moon, you know, potential moon bases coming to fruition because uh, yeah. without them, the world doesn't seem Anderson enough. No, that's right. So if you have any other things from the Jerry Anderson universe that you've seen come true in recent years, do let us know at podcast.jerryanderson.co.uk and uh, we'll read them out next time. I look forward to it. Now, you're sort of uh, foreshadowing a, an interview that we have in a couple of weeks' time with Theo Priestley, the uh-huh. futurist. But for now, we're going to go over to the world of gaming with Byron Great. Atkinson-Jones, who is currently a senior uh, engineer for PlayStation, has worked in gaming for a very long time, got his interest in all things entertaining, model-making uh, and sci-fi, mostly from the worlds of Anderson. So should we dive in and join Byron for a chat about the, all things Anderson-y and gaming-y? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, I'm doing that right now. I'm Byron, and I'm currently a principal engineer with Sony PlayStation, doing super secret stuff on a console that they not so long ago announced. Um, I have a five in the title. I don't know. I can't confirm or deny that. I'm the, the kind of job I do is a kind of bridge between R&D and the game developers. Mm, super okay. secret stuff. 
It's fun though. So if you, it. if you start off by saying, I did this amazing thing and I can't tell you anything about it, obviously that is quite tempting. I, it's terrible. It's terrible. I mean, people say to you, what, what is it you do? And I go, I could tell you, but I have to kill you. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, in that case, I won't really ask much more. So, okay. So, <laughs> so top secret game stuff. And what brought you into the, the world of Sony and the top secret PlayStation device numbered five, possibly? So this, I mean, Sony is a long journey. I mean, I've been doing this for about 25 to 30 years now, but, but, and this is going to sound really cheesy in a segue, it all really starts off with um, seeing early shows like, I'm going to name it, Space 1999, and which you've got behind you right now, Star Trek, Star Wars, all those things, you know, they kind of trigger something that kind of little brain of mine that goes, I want to do sci-fi stuff. And that kind of leads into doing games eventually, because there were sci-fi games back when I was got, first got into it. And then, um, you know, the real technical side of it. I, can, I get to build worlds that people can move around in Moonbase Alpha. You can do stuff Ooh. like that. Because working sometimes in VR, so, you know, I have made VR games moving around these huge space structures. So it's like a living the geeky dream that we wanted to live as kids but not being able to do it because I, I wasn't able to go to Moonbase, Moonbase Alpha like <laughs> you are currently. I must admit, the signal is really great for where you are. You know, no, no, no like even on the lunar surface, and I'm now, you know, uh, millions of miles across the, the universe from you. It's pretty good. So, pretty <laughs> so good, far, yeah. we're, I mean, you mentioned some other uh, non Jerry Anderson shows that I don't think any of our listeners will be familiar with, like Star yeah, Trek and stuff like that. So, there. you might yeah. touch on those possibly and maybe do some, some comparisons at some point. And uh, it'll be interesting, actually. I, I'm really keen to know later on in this chat what those sci-fi games were that you, you started to bridge you from, from telly into working there. But before we get there, I've also, funnily enough, on Moonbase Alpha here, got the TARDIS. So we'll pop in the TARDIS and uh, nip back to your uh, childhood or your earliest Anderson memories. It doesn't have to be the very first one. I don't need a particular specific time and place unless you know exactly when it was. But take me through an early or the earliest you can remember Anderson memory. Earliest one I remember, because I don't think I ever made the connection between Space 1999 back then and, say, mm. Thunderbirds. So I don't think that connection was made in my brain. But the earliest ones I remember. Now, I, I had a bit of a weird um, upbringing. I um, was actually born in Hong Kong and raised in Germany because my father okay. was in the army. So being stationed in Germany, we'd come back to the UK and, um, you know, they'd have the Saturday mm-hmm. matinee things on and Thunderbirds would be there. Uh, okay. So whenever we came back to the UK, we always looked forward to watching the new episodes. We didn't get them in Germany. And if we did get them, it would all be in German, which I couldn't understand anyway because I didn't <laughs> speak the language. So, you know, you had to get up early in the morning and watch the, get past the, uh, mentioning the non Jerry Anderson stuff like the, uh, you know, the, you know, Flash Gordon, yeah. you know, the real black and white serials. And then you get to the coloured stuff. There might be uh, Stingray, yes. I remember. I didn't see any of the other ones like Joe 90 um, and um, XL5. They didn't, they, I, don't know, I, I don't know about them since then, but they never appeared up. Stingray yeah. was definitely there. And Thunderbirds. Now, I was fascinated with how they did all the models mm-hmm. and how they did all the special effects. That, for me, was the draw. And being into sci-fi, I was like, wow, this is amazing, because there was nothing else like it on TV, was there? I mean, you, you'd have the really shaky BBC sets, and, you know, we could see them leaning on the wall, and some of the wall <laughs> is about to fall over, and some props it back up and again. But here you had this amazing film-like quality explosions, you know, and models and stuff like that and storylines that you just didn't get anywhere else. And the, the colour was, you know, it was vibrant. And it was just totally yeah. out there. It, and I loved it. I used to really look forward to it. There was a solid film budget level robustness to, to well, particularly to Thunderbirds, I guess. So what, yeah, what age yeah. would you have been when you, you first got a glimpse of Thunderbirds? Wow. This has been back in the 70s, I suppose. So I must have been about... Okay, it was pro Star Wars. I was about six when Star Wars came out, I think. So maybe okay. seven, eight. So a really good age to get yeah. into the kind of toys come to life thing. And uh, in contemporary with that, I mean, you, I'm guessing at that point you didn't have any sense that the show was already 13, 14, 15 years old. Did it seem new? No, I, I only found that out later on. And that was even more amazing thinking this stuff precedes those films we were seeing, you know, and, and they were doing that kind of level of effects. I mean, that's just... That was mind blowing when I first learned that. I mean, learning about Stingray was even more before that. It was just like, how did they do that back then? Seriously, there is something really amazing when you look at the time passing by. I mean, kids in the nineties had it when BBC repeated Thunderbirds in the nineteen nineties, and they were like, "Oh, it's just made, been made recently." I'm like, it's already, yeah, you know, twenty five plus years old. Yeah. So, contemporaneously to you watching Thunderbirds, 
stuff like Star Wars, okay, well, that's very comparable, particularly because some of the team that worked on Thunderbirds eventually would go across to Star Wars. And George Lucas went round the, the effects studio on Space 1999 to pick up tips and all sorts of other stuff. So we can credit a lot of that stuff with the Anderson world. And also change the look of the Millennium Falcon because it looked too much like the Eagle. <laughs> it's exactly. Yeah. So from the big screen, this small screen stuff was actually kind of comparable. But what, what else were you watching on TV at the time? Uh, it doesn't have to be stuff that had been made at that moment. You mentioned Star Trek. Were you watching those things alongside one another? For me, if it was sci-fi, I would be watching it because I was really, you know, that was my draw. My, my mother was much into sci-fi as well, to be honest with you. So if it was sci-fi related, you know, the Doctor Who... We didn't get so much of that, honestly, because um, that, again, would only be when I came mm. back to the UK. But um, like we say, the, the Space 99, I was heavily into that. That was my favourite show, okay. to be honest with you. That was, so when I saw you turn up with the, the background of the Moonbase Alpha right there, I was like, <laughs> yes! I've done it just for you. Because I love, I love the panels on the wall, you know, and the little communicators. In fact, I actually had those as toys, the uh, little um, the ray gun. And, yeah, I've got yeah, a comlock in it. my hand for listeners. Yeah. <laughs> comlock. And I'm you know, thinking, you know, we, you know, with the with the iPhone and FaceTime and stuff like that, we're now doing stuff that you know was predicted so many years ago in there. So, so the stuff, the technology. I mean, another factor I'm, I not many people credit with is a lot of sci-fi um, films and shows went down the hyper clean mm. approach. You know that it's it's sci-fi, so they won't have anything of rubbish. Things will be super clean and stuff like that. But no, they weren't. They were messy. They were real life. They were worn. And um, Star Wars took that on. George Lucas then said, you know, they, this has got to have the worn look because as he saw these shows before and they said, that looks more realistic. It's more realistic. It's more engaging. It's not sterile. And, you know, it drew you in that kind of stuff. You went detached from it. This wasn't an unattainable future that you couldn't exist, you couldn't have, couldn't have right now because, you know, stuff around us was falling to pieces <laughs> and things were worn because, you know, entropy takes yeah. place. Yeah? It's interesting trying to find a balance with the sci-fi thing where you've got, the future, which is so distant and pot- potentially unobtainable, but something so real world about it, like the the dirty down. I mean, that's down to Derek Meddings and later Brian Johnson making stuff filthy and greasy and having sort of burns around yeah, uh, jet blast areas. It grounded yeah. it. Though. It yeah. grounded it. Yeah, and it's it's makes. I mean, some, some sci-fi is so sci-fi you think that could never possibly exist, but now you're looking at thinking, well, that could exist because it looks like mm. it does exist. It's not. Yeah. There is a, an amazing sense of reality and weight that they managed to give the the shows. Because your viewing experience of them is maybe slightly more recent and you're watching a mix of science fiction, these days a lot of TV is so tightly aimed at various demographics. It would be unusual now yeah. for a kids' show or a kids' and family show to feature adults. And yet, 60s, 70s, so many what really were a kind of action adventure sci-fi kids series. Yes, they had some reason to to family. We're all crewed by adult characters. I mean, even the the Tracys in Thunderbirds, yes, they are sons, but they're older. They're, you know, broken voices, they're, you know, beardy, <clears throat> they've got grown up romantic stuff going on. Is that something that ever crossed into your mind as a kid? Was it an aspirational thing? I, I just I wonder about the value of having adult characters as aspirational characters that then maybe make you go down a certain path in your own life well i think it, i mean just looking back at it now as a kind of you know from a modern perspective it, it does seem a bit strange but at the same time i've got to wonder about how the, how that happened because you know all those adults who are making the decision now that they must be have kids in the show are the same people who probably grew up on the stuff with adults on the show so what happened to change that Okay, did somebody along the line say we can't have adults on the show? We've got to appeal to kids. It's like say, like in games, they used to say um, we've got to get more women playing games. So let me make it all the games pink. And it's like that's not real. That's not what you know people are looking for. Just just keep it real. Keep it realistic. I mean, um, you've got the what the Pokemon shows now with kids, and um, they're they're popular because they more because it's the anime type style, and and most people are represented with kids in that anyway. But in terms of uh, the more modern stuff, I find it less easy to watch because of that. And I don't know if that influenced me as a kid or because I was so used to sci-fi being adults. I don't think it ever occurred to me there was a difference. I think it would have been strange if that, I mean, okay, maybe maybe Star Trek Next Generation where they had Wesley <laughs> Crush on the bridge is thinking that just looks so much out of place. <laughs> oh, you're, you're not a Wesley Crush fan? Kid. No, I am. I quite like Wesley Crush. I prefer him as an adult when he appears in um, yeah. Big Bang Theory because I think he's <laughs> hilarious. 
and the way the way he takes the mick out of the Wesley Crusher character is just <laughs> this is great because he, he's a, he's yeah. acknowledged it. But it is a bit strange where they try to they try to do the broad appeal to everybody going have a kid on the on the bridge and all the different things. I mean, okay, it, it makes sense in your context, but it doesn't make sense in all contexts. And I think I preferred the earlier shows because they were a bit more realistic in the sense that we're not going to have a bunch of kids running around. This is an adult environment. It's not a, a family environment. It's harsh. It's dangerous. Yeah, there was a, a real world element. Well, a bit like the real world grounding of the vehicles, a real world grounding of the consequences yeah. and the danger of what was going on. Because I, I am not a Absolutely. fan of Joe Ninety. It's you know the listeners know that very well. And I think part of that is because they, you know, they had all these successes with adult groups, secret agents, all that sort of stuff. And then they suddenly went right. Let's put a kid in there. And for some people, they really loved that. They found that a great connection. But a lot of people kind of went well. That's not. I don't want to. I don't want to become that. That could be my friend now, and he's a bit annoying. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> then, yeah. But, but then I'd look at yeah. something like Space Nineteen Ninety Nine, where and then you, you were you picking that up around the same the same time, kind of late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, I remember having all the toys. So you had the Eagles and stuff. Because like that. that's quite grown up, ponderous, philosophical. Yeah. Does that mean that you were a bit of an odd kid, or was there something more about it that drew people in? Oh no, I I was. I was the stereotypical oh, well, the snap. Person. So, yeah. you know, I'm with you there, but you know what I mean? There's, there's something grown up and slow and, and not a ponderous is maybe not right because there are a lot of action bits and pieces in there, but it's a very different kind of a show. So what, what drew you in? I think cause I, I had a, I had a naturally, I mean, because I'm my mother, I, I would have really ne- inquisitive nature. I would want to learn about everything. And that show, like you said, had this kind of philosophical background to it. You know, the, the conversation like, do we have the right to do this? You know, we, we could take them out now, but do we have the right to do that? I can't remember the scientist's name, Bergman. Dr. Bain. Yeah. But yeah, do we have the right to, you would always often question the philosoph- yeah. philosophical side of it. You know, the Koenig was like, you know, you know, blowing them out Carter, but like, just let me out <laughs> them kind of thing. But there was always this kind of balance in there. And I think that to me was, was eye opening because it, you know, it means you can see different aspects to these things. You, there, are, there isn't just one side. You can see all the many different sides. And they represented that on the show. And I think that kind of seeped into me, so I, I didn't mm. give up learning. So I am where I am now is because of things back then in, turn, in, in the past would instill into me, just keep, keep learning, keep thinking about these things, keep expressing it, keep mm. reaching out, don't kind of thing. I know that, that's describing maybe a bit too much to the show, but you know, that's through my formative years. I mean, think if I'd gone back and just done, you know, outside playing football, I was terrible. I wasn't into sports at all. Maybe I missed out on that. Maybe I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. Or maybe you, you you were always wired for this, and you ended up developing on a FIFA game or something. I'm I'm showing my lack of knowledge here and interest in in football and football games, but I have done that once. I did actually work on FIFA. There you go. Once, so you yeah. would have done it anyway. <laughs> Which was a bit of a nightmare for some of you. No, into football, no I, so. I really really feel your pain there. Me neither. But Bergman in particular, I really really loved, and I've said before that I think he's a kind of close to um like a Doctor Who like character. There's yeah. something yeah. very comforting in him, and I and through. Through all of the Anderson shows, there tended to be a really strong father figure. So Jeff Tracy in Thunderbirds, obviously. Colonel White really was the kind of paternal figure in in Scarlet. Joe Ninety, I mean, all the adult men were kind of fatherly, but a bit weird. Literal father, Father Unwin in The Secret Service, which may not have crossed into your area. Ed Straker, Bergman, they're, they're always there. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the quirks of Dad's shows, I think, because he had a, a, a dad who he, he loved very much, but was a, a very weak man. So he was kind of painting the, this father figure, I think, that was kind of aspirational without knowing it. I don't think he was ever consciously aware. Did the, the sort of the family element of those shows bleed through to you or is it you know can you see it on reflection today on reflection i can yeah but you know little more me back then would have just been it's spaceships i want to look at them more kind of thing yeah <laughs> that is a very honest and straightforward appraisal uh <laughs> but uh, you, you, you gotta be honest i mean uh, things that I, I i'm a big believer that the things we expect get exposed mm. to do shape us so the my values and stuff like that are, 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 do come from those shows. They do come from Star Trek. They do, I'm a bit more accepting. I'm not not quick to blame. I, I can see other people's perspective on things, and I think that's because of you know in those shows those those moral dilemmas were posed to you. They you weren't given such a black and white outcome. There was there were grey bits in between. I'm really glad you said that. I don't think we've really touched on that before. There's a, a famous uh, famous ish uh, Mitchell and Webb sketch that i always find myself referring back to where it's the two nazis in the trenches looking at their 
uniforms and the skull and going, are we the baddies? Yeah. And, yeah. and you know there are bits of that which weren't really directly addressed necessarily in something like captain scarlet does scarlet come into your because they're the humans go to mars they fire first they start a war who's really the bad guy in that initial conflict yeah exactly yeah i've seen it later on i didn't see it when it first well i'll see when it was first out but yeah as an adult i've seen the remake of that, well, that was that was dad's sort of final project so uh you what did you feel about that you can pass honest judgment. It was all right. <laughs> no, it was all right. Yeah, for someone who's working in, in yeah. games, that, that well, I mean, you, you know how quick CG stuff ages, but... Well, it's it's more the kit, but you know, the mind control and taking over the brain, that's that's creepy yeah. as hell, but it, it's like, wow, that's, again, that's, you know, that's a subject, would it, would it would, uh, in the modern day um, kids show, would that get passed? You know, taking over brains? I mean, this is... Well, though. even then they were having uh, episodes rejected for being a bit too scary. And I, and I watch some of them now. We've, we've put a couple of free episodes up on our YouTube channel and you, you watch them and think there's no way Ofcom would allow that to be broadcast in the UK today. Yeah. There is actually one, one episode of Space 99 that still creeps me out of the day. I remember at the time, it's, um, I can't remember the title of it, but there's this alien that gets onto one of the eagles and they get sucked into it, and then this kind of corpse Dragon's just comes flying out. It's it's everybody's yeah. bedwetting nightmare. <laughs> yeah, that, I remember that being creeped yeah. out beyond belief about. And I, I still every time I think of it, it's like that one first comes to yeah, my mind. It, I mean, that I don't think you can get away with that now. It barely felt like kids' TV then. I'm sure because it was pretty, yeah. pretty terrifying stuff. But that particular visual, almost any fan of Space 1999, whether they just watched it once and never again. They still remember it. So it was pretty terrifying stuff. Uh, season one to season two is based 1999. Did you make that transition? Did you watch the sort of more rubber monster stuff? And how did you feel about that change? The, I prefer season one because they look more like your background there, the big expanse thing. The technology was obviously increasing. They got a higher budget for mm. season two, for the, uh, but the, the, the equipment looked a bit different and the staff changed. I can't remember. Was it Maya? Maya was in, Maya season, in season, one season two. two. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. So they obviously tried to up the uh, the appeal. Yes, back in that the appeal one. in inverted commas. <laughs> yeah, but season one is where my heart is. I mean, I always remember the the very first uh, the pilot where the um, guy is trying to bash through the window with mm. his helmet, and that was you know the real dangers of space. You know, mm. getting sucked out, and that was like there's there's a window just between you and the moon. This is just incredible, pretty terrifying. But that didn't uh, inspire you to try and actually get there, but kept you interested in sci-fi. Yeah, I didn't. I, I was a bit weird. I, I, I was acutely aware of the danger, so I wasn't really keen on going up in a spaceship at all, but I loved the idea of it. But again, it was more, I wanted to recreate all mm. the models. And I probably shouldn't tell you this story, but I remember um, I used to try and re- uh, make the models out of cardboard and stuff like that. I would take, you know, the kid stuff. I would actually recreate sets. I would have eagles on little sticks so I could make them fly across and do little shows with my friends. Amazing. But it all came to head one day, though, when I tried to recreate the special effects <sighs> of blowing stuff up. And uh, ra- raiding my parents' alcohol because I knew that burned. So therefore, if I mixed it, it should create explosion. It didn't. Okay, nothing happened. But my parents were going, "What's going on here? <laughs> Why do you smell a booze?" Yes, yeah. I can imagine. Uh, that, but I, that's amazing, though, isn't it? That a TV show can get a kid to go to that those lengths and to try and recreate it. It must have some powerful effect. More from Byron next week in part two. And if you would like mm-hmm. to follow him on Twitter, where he names himself Byron super nerd you can oh. follow him at Ziotex. that is obviously x-i-o-t-e-x <laughs> right <laughs> obviously yeah so yes and you can see on there it, uh, all the sort of fun stuff he's doing a great he tweets a great mixture of all things nerdy bits of game stuff and yeah. uh yeah, much more besides. And also you can get some free gaming stuff from his website too. So um Yeah, yeah. Great. Follow Very him there. Right. Yeah. Now Richard James. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's some exciting stuff that might happen ahead in the randomizer. But before we get there, is there anything else you oh. want to deliver from the Podsterons? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a nice little teaser. I'm looking forward to that now. Yes. Now we're talking about Twitter. Twitter is a fantastic place, of course, where you can connect with the people you most admire, stars that you love, and interact with those who would normally seem sort of out of reach. Or you can use it to get in touch with us here at the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Uh, just hashtag us, <laughs> Jerry Anderson Podcast. Tag me, Richard and James. Him, I'm Jamie Anderson. Or him over there, Chris Dalek. For example, Ride Theory said, after two weeks of multiple health screens and asking everyone to quarantine, I surprised my close inner circle with a trip to a private island where we could pretend things were normal just for a brief moment in time. I posted a couple of pictures 
of Tracy Island. <laughs> yes, yes, that Kim, course, Kim Kardashian yes. thing has gone pretty crazy. Sorry, <laughs> you were right. going to explain no, no. it for anyone yeah. not in the know. You You've done it. Uh, Lost in Transition said, just listening to this week's Jerry Anson podcast and your randomizer episode is Space 1999 Force of Life. Yes, one of my favourite top five episodes. Thank you for sharing this moment. I completely agree. This episode has so many great moments. Megan said, hearing Chris Dalek being held in a Sith force choke by Lord Vader made this Sith's heart full as I was dealing with a severe dose of vertigo. Kudos to all. There's also been a few uh, First Action Bureau reviews. Very high quality, they say. Well-written sci-fi drama with an amazing cast and production values that are as strong as any classic Anderson show. Even though it's audio drama, it somehow manages to seem cinematic. Episodes are short but full of action and mystery. Keeps you wanting more. Fantastic music and sound design deserve special mention. They are among the best I've heard, and I really hope this gets more than just one series. Someone else with far too long a name for me to mention says, Oh, this is good. Not just good, very, very good. If you've not seen the trailer on YouTube, please take a look as it sets the series up beautifully with some absolutely fantastic visualisations. The cast is superb, especially the lead character, played to a T by Genevieve Gaunt and good old Richard James, he was in Space Racing, you know, gets to really stretch his legs and vocal cords, play multiple characters. Go on, listen to the first episode and you'll be hooked, even if you aren't a regular Andiverse fan. Highly recommended. Thank you very much for all that. Just a little uh, soup song of how well First Action Bureau is going down. Yes, it has been very well received. And uh, I really hope that we will uh, be able to do a, a season two because uh, oh, yeah. you won't believe what happens next. Oh, wow. Great. <laughs> Look forward to it. OK, that's enough teasing there. Can I be Nero Jones next time? <laughs> I think uh, Genevieve might have something to say about that. <gasps> OK. Uh, let's see, though. You never know. I think uh, Angus Reed may be uh, appearing again. So, oh, fine. Yeah, that could be interesting. Right, anyway, that's enough of that stuff. Yes. I think we need to go over to Chris Dale and his marvellous randomizer because I'm sure it's something very exciting. Oh, woo. It always is. And why did we drive a mile from the base to meet this colonel? Security. No one must see him, except us. Here he comes out. Pass on that jacket and stand up straight. Remember, he's a colonel. I don't believe it. Must be some kind of joke. We're all right, Johnson. Leave this to me. Ah, morning, men. Are we ready for action? Ah, uh, listen, son. If this is some sort of prank... I beg your pardon? Oh, Sarge, this has gone far enough. W- 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 what are you saying? I'm, I'm not a colonel? Now, listen. I think we ought... I am so too a colonel. Look, look, I have a badge. And as long as I have this badge, I'll be giving the orders around here. And, and telling you what to do, all right? Sir, what are we going to do? Right, that's better. Well, one of you, and I don't mind which, is going to be pressing the button on the randomizer today in order to select a random Jerry Anderson episode at random. Oh, but why? That's what I don't understand. Why what? What, you mean, why do I do this? Well, it's because, I mean, it's it's because, um... Well, look, just, just, just less of that lip, Johnson, and a bit more button pressing, please. You carry our orders, Johnson. Yes, Sergeant, but I think we're both crazy. Ah, excellent work, Johnson. That's some fine button pressing. So, men, what are we hoping for today? A bit of story. What you love. Well, an admirable goal, Johnson. Let's see if you've come through for us. Oh, well, it's certainly been a few months since we last heard anything from Fireball XL5. Five, Tim, what's the difference? Fireball XL5 does tend to get the more exciting missions, and they're back today with Dangerous Cargo. Is the episode all keyed up, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Ready to go. Ah, jolly good. Well, you can count me out. Go ahead! Kill yourself! Oh, it can't be that bad, surely. So, welcome back to Fireball XL5 on the randomizer, and, uh... I don't know about you, but right now, this is exactly the sort of thing I'm in the mood for. A bit of Fireball XL5 with dangerous cargo as we open on what appears to be a uh, an, an abandoned mining facility on a planet somewhere. Ooh, planet Pharos. Siluvium mine opened... Oh, the sign's blown away. And one of the mining uh, derricks has collapsed. So it's obviously been abandoned a long time. This is Steve. Pharos. 
the derelict planet. Okay, Matt. Is Robert in central control? Yep. Because there's only one. I love that with Fireball XL5. It was always the, the derelict planet, the desert planet, the ice planet. There was only one planet that had, you know, that could be defined by a single characteristic. There was never like two of them or, or more than two. Anyway, off down to the planets. Doesn't look very safe, but I'm sure the XL5 crew are well prepared to uh, to deal with uh, any any problems they might come across here. Oh, the fish is opening up in the ground, like right next to where they landed. So it's quite clear this planet is a death trap, which is why they're all leaving Fireball Junior, just in case it uh, happens to fall into the wide open space that's right next to the ship. What a dismal planet! Everything falling to pieces. It's what we expected, Venus. Remember, the robot miners took every piece of Solivium away from Ferris years ago. Yeah, now the planet is so riddled with mine shafts it could break up at any minute. I don't want to be around when it happens. Say, look, over there. Those flowers. Oh, God. Venus. Beautiful. Well, as far as I'm concerned, they can stay there. Just yeah. look. Screw you and your flowers, woman. Fall down. Venus, you come with me. Uh, Matt, do a little exploring and report back in an hour. Okay, Steve. Steve and Venus are heading down into a mine shaft. I'm not sure why this mine shaft is um, worthy of attention, considering they, they all agree that the whole planet is about to fall apart. Let's go into the most dangerous and obviously about to collapse place we can find. As I figured, pretty dangerous. Okay, Venus, I've seen enough. Let's get out of here. Okay, Venus, you can get into trouble now. Go off on your own and scream, and I'll come and find you. Oh, they only just got out of there when the place collapsed. Huh? The planet will have to be destroyed, Steve, before it just falls apart. Now, that'll be my recommendation, that's for sure. Come on, let's get back and make out our reports. Well, I suppose that's one planet less in the universe. At least there's no life here to worry about. Hmm. Uh oh. I never thought when we landed we would meet the cursed Steve Zodiac. Subterrains. What they said they are going to return here and destroy this planet. I heard. This is perfect. The planet will not be the only thing to be destroyed. <laughs> uh, two subterrains, the very first villains introduced in Fireball XL5, in fact. I'm not sure what they're doing on the planet. They can start the landing countdown. Right. First time we've seen them on the randomizer too, I believe. I think they made uh, four appearances in the series. Hope he hasn't caused Commander Zero too much trouble. This isn't an episode I remember too well. I think this was one of the very last, if not the last, episode to be released on uh, on VHS back in the 90s, and uh, this wasn't a tape I had. Zuni is, would you, sir? Lieutenant, I had to get this on the tape trading network later on. I haven't seen him all day. He's probably asleep somewhere. I hope. So. Zuni has been allowed to wander off by himself. Where's he gonna go? Well, main power plant looks like a good place to play. And of course, the door is not kept locked. There's no password or security card needed. He can just go in there and start jumping on things. And make the tower spin round really fast. Oh, that's this episode, right. It's one of those things, I suppose, Having built the model to spin, they must have been just stand there, Lieutenant. Do something. Tempted to uh, to make it spin out of control at some point, but uh, even so, I mean, I don't know how many people work in that Space City Tower. It must be quite a few. And Zuni has once again proved. Report, Lieutenant. Just let me get my hands on whoever caused this. He's a complete liability. Oh, look at the mess. Oh, I wouldn't like to be in your shoes, laddie, when the commander hears about this. You stupid, idiotic creature. That's it, go for it. Oh, Zuni's hiding behind Venus. Come back here when I'm shouting at you. Oh, but, dear. But he didn't mean it, commander. You keep out of this, Venus. Why, I ought to take you and fire you into space. Unexplored space. So you couldn't get up to your mischief, you overgrown, half-baked son of a... Oh, make him stop, Steve. No, Venus, this time Zuni's got to be punished. He's got to learn sometime. No, I'm quite interested in this firing him into space thing, Venus. I don't see him anymore. Oh, Come on, Zuni. So, yes, that's the subplot for this episode. Um, 
What on earth are they going to do with Zuni while they're away? So we can get some work done. Okay, come on. Which is an interesting thing if this wasn't like episode... Well, this is episode 27 in broadcast order. Why is this only now a problem, what to do with Zuni when they go away, considering that Zuni very rarely accompanies them on the ship? Like three quarters of the missions we've seen them do, they leave Zuni on Earth. So who's looking after him then? Well, gentlemen, I agree with you. It'll have to be destroyed. Anyway, Commander Zero is all on board with a plan to destroy the planet. The planet in its present condition, missiles would only break it up. Yeah, I see what you mean. It's very close to the freighter routes. If it broke up, it'd take years to clear it away. Then it'll have to be complete disintegration. You can use Vesivium 9. V Vesivium? Ooh. Vesivium 9? Oh, what's the matter, Professor? What? That's the greatest explosive force in the universe! Exactly! I love that none of them have actually sort of... None of them feel slightly guilty for being at least partly responsible for overmining the planet to the point where it has to be destroyed. It's just like, no, planets are there to be exploited, all their resources taken, and then we destroy them. As is our want. For we are gods among the universe, and we decide which planets live and die. And this is a lovely shot as well, this... Um, Vesuvium 9 crate being taken out to the XL5 launch ramp. This... Yeah, the models here look a bit more... Uh, a bit more detailed than probably I'd expect to uh, to see from Fireball XL5. I'm also looking at the... Uh, the um, I'm not sure what you call it, tractor thing on the front of the... Uh, or that, that, that's brought the crate out to XL5. It looks very familiar. Um, I think it must have appeared in later productions. Dave, if they make you leave Space City, I won't be able to stop them. Oh, oh that's on the cards, is it? Oh. And I just couldn't bear to lose you, Zuni. Oh, dear. Please let Zuni come with us. What? You can't be so tooty as to want him around with our cargo. Oh, but, but he wouldn't be any trouble, Steve. <laughs> Please. Please, Steve. Um, I can't leave him with the commander, you know that. And there's literally nobody else in Space City at all. And I'll tell you something else, you can't bring him aboard Fireball either. Oh, oh you, you beast. <laughs> oh uh, I guess it won't hurt to have two beasts aboard Fireball. Oh God, okay, Steve. he can come. But on my That's probably Venus's most pathetic moment. And there are quite a few. Ah, oh, so Zuni has now been locked in the XL5 Space Jail. Oh, and he does not look happy about it at all. All stations, stand by. Clear space routes. XL5 priority liftoff. Well, that was an unusual uh, shot of the XL5 launch motors kicking in there. Now we're off to the... Uh, the standard launch sequence, absolutely gorgeous. XL5, you're gonna need it. Maintain course, Robert. Maintain course. Can I go and see Zuni, Steve? Okay, just so long as you don't let him out. I'll go to the nav bay and see how Matt's making out. I should probably just lock Venus in the space jail with him. She's probably gonna be, uh... <laughs> just as little use as he is. Held together, Matthew Maddock. No time to go all the pieces. <laughs> yeah, they've just dumped the explosives in the navigation bay with Matt. Welcome. In a big crate. Um, and of course, this this ship has never run into any unexpected uh, turbulence that could perhaps set the uh, the explosives off. <laughs> oh God. Uh, see, now not so much noise. Take it. It's good that we've got our best people on this mission. We've got the uh, the crybaby who insists on bringing her uncontrollable space monkey along, and we've got... Hey, don't move! ...the panickiest What's professor. You're wearing a ray gun! <laughs> There's no danger. The capsule in that ray gun, it could explode. Only when it's taken out. Honestly, Matt, I wish you'd calm down. So now I'm wondering what, what those subterranes were doing here. Have they been left behind deliberately just on the off chance that some human explorers might happen along or do they have some other sinister plan welcome back oh, colonel zodiac <laughs> we've been standing on this one exact spot since you left first 
We'll see how they intend to blow up the planet. Yes. We might find a way to keep them on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get this unloaded. Uh, where are you going to put it, Steve? I found just the place on my last trip here. One of the old mine shafts. XL5 calling Space City. Colonel Zodiac reporting. Zero hour for explosion, 1,600 hours. Message understood. I will divert all space freight. Roger. Over and out. Steve, can I let Zuni out now? Well, I guess... Shut up! Okay. But under no circumstances is he to leave the ship. It's supposed to be a professional, isn't she? I mean, that's not just something I've invented. Oh, we must wait for Steve Zodiac and the beautiful Earth woman. <laughs> and then... Oh, yes, that was a line the subterranes used in, in their first appearance, Planet 4-6. The beautiful Earth woman. They had a bit of a thing for Venus. And the way she's been behaving this week, I think they're welcome to her. Dead at all. Now, Zuni, you must stay with Robert. You what? And please, please be good. <laughs> yes, they're leaving their space monkey who has repeatedly proven he cannot be trusted. I think I'll have time to get some of those lovely flowers. Oh, stop it! They've left Zuni in the cockpit of XL5 with Robert. Because that's not a situation that could backfire, and indeed has backfired on them before. Set it for one hour from now. That where, where do the XL5 crew keep their brains? Because it's clearly not in their heads. Oh. There's some okay. serious evil chuckling from the subterranes there. They're about to lever a great big rock onto the entrance to the shaft. There it goes. Aha. What's happened, Steve? There seems to have been some kind of rock fall. The entrance is blocked. Oh, Steve, what do we do? And what about Zuni? Come, let us leave while there is still time. Back to our spaceship. <laughs> Why did we even come to this planet in the first place? I still don't understand why. There's not much time, Steve. And I think that's it for the subterranes this episode, so... Um, there must be a way out. There must yeah, in their other three appearances, they were far more... Uh, integral part of the story. This time, they're... Um, well, that's the halfway point, I think, and uh, they've already left. XL5 crew trapped down a hole. Space City calling XL5. Space City calling XL5. So it's just the robot and the space monkey aboard. And the planet is still disintegrating around XL5. By the look of this place, we won't have to wait for the bomb. We'll be buried alive. Well, you know, there's, there's, there's points on both sides here. Stop this thing, Matt. Not a chance. It's set to go off at 1,600 hours. If I touch it, it'll explode immediately. Oh, Steve, I'm scared. And poor little Zuni and Robert. Well, yeah, Robert, okay, yeah, I sympathize with Robert, but Zuni, no. That's it. That could be the answer. What do you mean, Steve? I don't understand. Robert is our robot. Tim here on the jetmobile. Oh, I did not know this, Steve. Robert, Robert, listen carefully. You are to collect a thruster pack and leave the XL5. Collect the Rasta Magalie XL5. Take a UHF radio with you and await further instructions. Let's hope it works, Steve. Yeah. You take a jetmobile up to the opening mat and listen for Robert. Leave the XL5. Good riddance to Space Monkey. I think Zuni might actually have helped Robert put his uh, thruster pack on back there. That's quite sweet. Anyway, Zuni is now all alone aboard XL5. Robert's coming to save the day as the, I think, only competent member of the XL5 crew this week. Indeed, most weeks. But Zuni is following him out the ejector tube. Robert, you are now to proceed in the following direction. Steer 1890 white. I really like actually the design of Robert. I'd be interested to see some more photos of him in colour. Um, to see how he looks with the, the electronic eyes flashing with his dialogue. Obviously it's 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 Jerry's voice which makes the character more more notable, but it's a really nice design. Move the rocks. Move the rocks. 
And I also like that the character is you know, pretty much iconic for this show, but he he doesn't really have a character as such. And we saw just there as he got off XL5, because that was all he'd been told to do, he didn't do anything else. And he's now trying to move this rock off the... Uh... It's no use! It's like asking a man to move a mountain! Oh, he's not doing too bad. Return to XL5. Oh. But Steve, Robert, he was our last chance. Oh, there is always Zuni Venus. They've got to leave that place by 1530, Lieutenant. Otherwise, Fireball won't get clear of the explosion. Yes, sir. Boy, if they get out of this, I'll even forgive Zuni. Oh, those flowers are back. Calling XL5. Calling XL5. Why is Robert not answering when Earth calls? Is he only programmed to, to answer the XL5 crew? Hey, Steve, you're still wearing your Riga. I'm sure that's not consistent with previous episodes. But, but the capsule in it is highly explosive. Only when it's taken out of the gun. Hey, of course, you're right, Matt. I could blow us all up now and save the bomb the time. Be careful, Steve. Those atomic capsules can explode as soon as you touch them. Well, in our situation, we've got nothing to lose. Again, I, I'm still thinking of the, the subterrain's involvement with this episode, because they need... they almost need not have come for this. It's like the rock could have just fallen on the whole by accident. The planet is falling apart anyway. So... This seems like a really minor appearance for them. I'd still love to know why they were on this planet in the first place. They didn't seem to be doing anything. And as I said, when the XL5 crew left, went back to Earth and then returned, they were still standing in exactly the same spot. Anyway, I mustn't grumble about the subterrains because they're already long gone. Come on, explode! Oh, I'm doing my best, Steve. That's got it. Oh. The great big wire attached to the rock might also have helped there, as it's blown it clear of the entrance. You've done it! Hooray! That's it. We've not got long to spare, but XL5 is uh, underway. One minute. Steve, I can't find Zuni anywhere. Don't worry, Venus. He must be on board somewhere. But he isn't. Well, he certainly couldn't have got out. Unless... Unless we left the door open. Oh, Steve! He must still be on the planet! Oh, well, except all losses, Venus. Steve. How can we? There's only ten seconds left. The bomb almost looks like it has a face as well. Oh, that's it. Planet gone. Big old explosion. Zuni! Oh, Zuni! And Zuni is no more. My dinosaurs. Clearly very dead. They certainly wouldn't fake us out that Zuni is dead. Zuni was on the planet. Of course I heard. Take over, Lieutenant. <coughs> and to think how mean I was to that poor little Zuni. Oh, I love Commander Zero, despite the fact that this is all clearly just one big fake out. I do love the... Uh, the slightly more sensitive side to Commander Zero at times like this. We're sorry you are. We I'm got... sorry you ever came on board. I mean, I'm glad he's dead. All right, kid. Oh, but guess what? I bet you can't guess what. His voice. I feel as if he's right here in the room with me. Oh, no, that's his stink. Oh, oh. Oh, he went to pick the flowers that Venus admired earlier. Oh, Zuni, one of those beautiful flowers. You picked it for me. Welcome home. So, Zuni survives to irritate us all another day, and that was Dangerous Cargo, which was a, a bit of a mixed bag there. I, I think on the whole, I, I would have to say I enjoyed that one, despite the... Well, firstly, the minimal use of the subtrains that was rather disappointing for their first outing on the randomizer, but no doubt we'll see better from them whenever they next turn up. Also, just um, an episode focusing a bit too much on Zuni, maybe. I I don't think the uh, the Anderson shows really benefited from having an, an animal sidekick around, and uh, 
this episode is, is probably a good example of why it just didn't work because the character is so clearly irritating clearly useless clearly does not belong on any any military base or installation whatsoever because he's so destructive and terrible and um yeah i mean i don't know maybe as, as a kid uh zuni appealed to you he certainly didn't appeal to me so uh yeah on the whole a mixed bag of fireball xl5 goodness there but uh still pretty enjoyable as most episodes so far have been well can't mm. have it all, can you? But a nice bit of Fireball XL5, I suppose that's all yeah. right. You know, again, yeah, of course it is. Funny that uh, up front we're talking about Fireball XL5 in colour and then the randomised but is Fireball XL5. It's, yeah, uh, well, there we are. Bizarre serendipity yeah. once again. And uh, yeah. yeah, don't worry, in case you weren't, you know, you weren't 100% clear on what happened there, Zuni is fine because they didn't leave him behind on the exploding planet, so it's all okay. Because <laughs> I know you were terrified, Richard, about uh, oh, uh, what, what was going to happen. I was going to tonight after that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Randomizer is fantastic. So it'll be back next week, of course, with another random episode. The only part of our podcast to get a podcast all of its own. But I, uh, seriously, am looking forward to the Richard James Newsy News 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 podcast, which I know, Jamie, you're going to introduce as a little standalone item. Absolutely. And uh, shortly after, we'll be doing the uh, post-credits banter uh, podcast <laughs> where we just no we're not don't worry we're not going to do that absolutely not and now Jamie yes Richard James well you were rather cheeky a couple of weeks ago weren't you because what you gave a little gift to the world at very short notice no, and that I didn't. was a brand new Firestorm oh mini mini sewed yes which uh, nano <laughs> nano sewed <laughs> that's right which last time I looked was heading towards sort of twenty thousand views already so that's mm. uh, doing very well now I did take the opportunity to having a look uh, to see what people were saying about it underneath on our YouTube channel oh dear. Uh, gaming ninja for example said well that was super short but you've got to admit the ultra marination puppets and so much more more realist are so much more realistic than the old super marination puppets wouldn't mind even seeing a thunderbirds short done in ultra marination in 2021 mm. brett brown says i was born in the uk in 1962 i grew up on fireball xl5 stingray thunderbirds joe 90 and all the rest of them this works imagine thunderbirds done in this style this test looks modern but still has a 60s charm to it it works well done andrew sierra said just love everything about this test footage from sam's puppet movements to the realistic models and special effects if jerry were still alive today i believe he would give this and the pilot's minisode a fabulous thumbs up can't wait for the full series and uh, mark evans said why aren't there any tv channels chomping at the bit to support further development i would love to see this come to the screen as a series kudos to everyone involved in what has been developed so far well mark how do you know i mean you know do you know something we don't no mm. exactly well, well, and, well we can't yeah. we can't say can we but, no. Uh, no i'm glad everybody's enjoying that and uh, yeah. there'll be more to come but uh, no. yes just it's amazing how a little test shoot can become something yes. a bit more it's very nice yeah my, my favorite comment actually was one that i read and then I, I looked back a couple of hours later to try and copy it to read out now and i couldn't find it but but the general gist of it was this guy who said uh, yeah it's great the puppet looks great but, but what a shame about the cgi on the puppet's face uh, <laughs> to yeah. which uh, i think it was ac replied uh, uh there was no cgi on the puppet's face yeah that was the puppet that's how good it is it is amazing actually that it gets to the point where people can't tell whether it is one or the other and that's a really yeah. interesting sign of uh of how far the animatronics has come so yeah, yeah. it's exciting lots of stuff all firestormy and other things going on right now behind the scenes so uh yeah very more good. when we can talk about it but we can't yet now <laughs> richard james is that sort of bringing yes. us to the end of this episode of the jerry anson podcast i feel like it probably is yeah I think so. Yeah, you sure? Yeah, I reckon. Okay, well, then please, listener, if you've enjoyed this or any of our podcasts, or even if you haven't really enjoyed it that much, please do subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. A uh, little review goes a long way to helping other people to find it and make sure that mm. they uh, they know what they're going to be letting themselves in for. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, for letting us pat ourselves on the back. Because um, Yeah, that's the main reason. We need a bit of back patting. Yeah, Particularly we, we, Richard, he's got a terribly bad back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Drop us a line, podcast at jerryanson.co.uk, and we will be back for pod 127 in approximately one week's time from the release of this one. Wow. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Okay. Until then, we bid you a fond farewell. Bye. Let's go. Stage 
drum is green. What does fond farewell actually mean? A fond farewell? Bidding someone a fond farewell? Is, well, it, bidding... is it the polar opposite of good riddance, basically? Well, I suppose it is, yes. If you fa- you're, you're bidding someone to fare well, aren't you? To travel well, to, ah. you know, to fare well. Do you know what? I never even considered the, the etymology of farewell until you said it just you know, then. It's how I spend my time, Jamie. I know. Well, you are a mm. famous etymologist, aren't you? So. Oh, yeah. I love insects. <laughs> hey? Amazing. Is that that's that's why you're Richard N. James? He's putting the yeah. e, the N in etymology. <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly. This is getting a bit weird, isn't it? Should we? Yeah. I, I think we've had would. too much time on the recording and not enough coffee. So I think you're probably right. Let's go and get more coffee and no more recording. Bye. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. 